It is now time for oral questions. And I recognize the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Today, students across Ontario will be walking out of their classrooms for a very simple reason. They want the Premier to know that they are going to fight for their future. The future the Premier has planned for them means fewer classes in the the member for Davenport. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order. The point of privilege has been addressed. The ruling has been made. Let's move on. Apologize to the member for Davenport. The member for Sault Ste. Marie will come to order. Start the clock. Once again, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The future the Premier has planned for them means fewer classes in the arts, fewer classes in the skilled trades, fired teachers, larger classrooms. And that is not something they're going to accept lying down. What does the Premier have to say to students who are already tired of being told to expect less for their future? Premier, we're being told that by the NDP. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, this isn't about class sizes, I'll tell you. This is about the union bosses telling the teachers and the students what to do. Our teachers have a responsibility to the parents. They have a responsibility to the students to make sure that they stay in the classrooms and teach the students. We, we know that the grade six students, 50% of them are failing math. Maybe they should keep them in the classroom to teach them more math. Maybe the teachers should focus on learning math themselves because we know one third of those teachers can't pass the same grade six math test as they're giving the students. We saw what happened under the Liberals. We saw what happened with the big union bosses when they, well, I guess there's no Liberals in here. Uh, I guess the union bosses. Okay. Premier will take a seat. Premier will take a seat. Yeah, we, we can't make reference to the absence of members. Stop the clock. Once again, I'll remind all members, we don't make reference to the absence of members when they're not in the House for obvious reasons. Is he still the time? Yeah. Okay, start the clock. The Premier has a few more seconds to wind up. Yeah. Our, our focus as government, through you, Mr. Speaker, is making sure that we aren't on the lowest tier in the entire country, the entire country, when it comes to grade six math students. Grade six math students should be at the top tier, not 50% failing math. Here, here. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Member for Davenport again. I'm going to continue with my question. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to continue with my question to the Premier. It is not just students raising concerns. School boards are warning the Premier that his plan will have disastrous consequences for our students and their futures. Boards in Peel, Toronto, Hastings and Prince Edward have written to the government. Today, the Limestone Board in Kingston and Frontenac warns increasing average high school class size will have, and I quote, dramatic and harmful effects on students and staff. They say as many as 80 teachers could lose their jobs in that board alone. Why is this Premier ignoring these warnings? Premier. Again, through you, Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, and it's not about class sizes, because we will have the lowest class size in the entire country. You look at BC, has, a, has 30, 30 to a class, Quebec has 32. You look at Alberta, Saskatchewan, PEI, they have no cap. We're proposing 28. We will still be the lowest in high school anywhere in the entire country. Our focus is to make sure we focus on literacy, on math, the skills that are going to help these students, the students up there, the students back there, to actually get a job when they come out, use the math skills, not ignore the math skills, not get bullied by a bunch of union bosses at the teachers' union. Let's start focusing on the students and stop using the students as a bunch of pawns, because that's what the union bosses are doing right now. It's absolutely shameful that they're using our students for a bunch of pawns. Please take your seats. Restart the clock. 
Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know what's shameful? What's shameful is that response from this premier and the creative math he's Government using side, to come, come to order. Fiction about class sizes. Boards are also noting that the government's plan government just will not work for their students. Under their new plan, this government says students must complete four mandatory online courses to graduate. But in a letter to the government, the Hastings and Prince Edward District School Board has said, we know that in many areas of our school board, students are unable to access reliable internet service and or transportation to an accessible location. I'm sure this is something that uh, the House leader would have already passed on to the Premier, but how are students supposed to complete online courses if they don't have online online access, Mr. Premier. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, when the students are in the classroom, they're going to learn to make sure that they understand math skills. Every single job you go into, you have to understand. I'll tell you a story, Mr. Speaker. Before I got into politics, I had a university graduate, a university graduate come by. I was interviewing this person out of the blue, and I've never done that. Out of the blue, I said, what's seven times seven? Wouldn't you believe they look around for their phone to calculate seven times seven? A person that graduated from university doesn't understand the basic timetable? It's, it's un unbelievable. But I have an idea. Through Bill 48, we're actually getting new teachers to make sure they focus on math skills. I have an idea. Why don't we test all the teachers rather than just the new ones on learning how to deliver math? Members will take their seats. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Once again, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again to the Premier. This morning, the Minister of Education took to the airwaves and she said she was ready to listen to students. Well, students are telling the government clearly they don't want larger class sizes. They don't want teachers losing jobs, and they don't want to lose courses that teach everything from art to music to skilled trades. Those are actually courses that lead to good jobs and boost our economy, Premier. If the Premier wants a dialogue, if the Premier wants a dialogue, can he start one right now by explaining why he is forcing these cuts on students? Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it's my pleasure to rise today and talk about what we're doing. We're not going to be giving in to union stunts like what we are seeing happening and being fostered by the members opposite. We're not going to be teaching based on ideology and hidden agendas. We are going to be focusing on what we learned during our consultation last fall, and that is parents, teachers, students alike want to be focusing on the fundamentals that will ensure them a great career pathway forward. And that's what we're doing. And you know, it's interesting, there was a reference made to some media I was doing earlier this morning. Well, I met a young man that the Minister of Finance and I spoke to when he was a member of a roundtable on financial literacy. He thanked me for where we landed with regards to curriculum that resulted from our fulsome consultation last fall. That's an example of listening. That's an example of getting it right. Absolutely. And that's what we're going to continue to do. We're going to continue to listen. Thank you. Order. Stop the clock. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Uh, I can assure you that the students in this province don't need us or the unions to make them angry right now. You're doing a heck of a job of it on your own. Instead of listening to students, government side come to order. Instead of listening to students, the Ford government has done 
everything they can to dismiss their concerns. They claim students are playing politics. They claim students aren't listening, even as they dismiss young people speaking out about their concerns for their future. Mr. Speaker, instead of ignoring these young people, will the Premier consider the possibility that smaller class sizes, fewer teachers, and fewer course options might not be a great idea? Questions been referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're focused on the fact that the education system is broken in Ontario. Yep. That is a fact. And because of that, we reached out and we consulted and we listened and we brought in people to tell us what they really want. And in fact, parents, they, they think that teachers should be in the classroom today teaching their yep. students because we all know the education system has failed our students. We can't afford to lose another generation of students that do not know how to do seven by seven, as the Premier mentioned earlier. So let me be very clear. In the past, we know union bosses have organized walkouts against the previous Liberal government. I'm concerned that we may be seeing the very same thing right now. And quite frankly, we're concerned about the issues that really are going to be pertinent to the students, and that is math. That is fundamental basic skills in terms of science, technology, engineering, and math. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Clock. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. Uh, just to be clear, it's not teachers that are walking out today, it's students across oh. this province. I, and I, would ask the Minister, I would ask the Premier, the Premier to give us the exact number of parents or anyone else who asked for larger class sizes and less teachers in our classrooms because everybody wants to know. The Ford government has been very quick to criticize students who are standing up for their futures. But I want to quote one student I listened to today. She said, we are forced into a political arena right now. Our futures are on the line. I wouldn't say we're the ones who are politicizing our classrooms. These students are Order. fighting for a good education and a bright future, and I'd say that's pretty darn resilient of them. Instead of dismissing their Question. voices along with teachers, parents, and school board voices, why won't the Premier listen? Well, Speaker, I just would like to remind the member opposite that last June, we were elected with an overwhelming mandate here, here. to fix the education here, here. system here, here. in Ontario. Ontario. We need to going. fix Ontario, and we're going to start with our classrooms, and we're going to make sure that we have great learning environments. And that means that we're going to make sure teachers are focusing on the basics and the fundamentals. I am so proud that we passed Bill 48 yesterday, because every new teacher coming out of Teachers College to register will have to pass a math test. That's going to give confidence to our parents. That's going to give confidence to our employers. And we're seriously considering all our other options because we want to make sure the people in the classroom have the best skills to ensure students are learning the proper things. But I want to be perfectly clear, Speaker, today. Response. Perfectly clear. No one, not one person in this province gets to veto our education plans because last year, we listened to 72,000 people. No matter what. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Timmins. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, last month, the member for Landart Frontenac Kingston raised serious concerns about possible illegal lobbying being carried out by some of the Premier's closest advisors. The member for Essex passed these concerns on to the Ontario Provincial Police. We have now learned that they have referred this matter to their anti-racket squad. Will the Premier pledge today that he and his office will work with the police and any other officials conducting the investigation? Premier. For, for, for you, Mr. Speaker, there's no illegal lobbying going on. Very simple. No one can influence our team. No one can buy our team. Very simply, if you want to talk to the government, call me on my cell phone. You hand it out anyways. Supplementary. Premier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those applause. Much appreciated. 
Premier, we've seen in the past where premiers have destroyed documents within their office. We've seen that show before. Will the Premier and will you instruct your staff that all emails, text messages and any, any relevant records are to be maintained while the OPP do their work? Will you promise no records will be destroyed in your office? Before I ask the Premier to reply, again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Premier to reply. Minister of Economic Development. That was the Liberals that deleted. Thanks, uh, thanks to the member opposite uh, for the question. It's pretty clear that uh, the Premier is the most accessible Premier that this province has right. ever yeah. seen. Yeah. I think uh, of the 14 million people that live in Ontario, there are many million that actually do have his cell phone number, much to the chagrin of his staff. I must say, and the Premier is uh, very loyal to that uh, smartphone and uh, gets back to as many people as he possibly can. You know, the Integrity Commissioner of Ontario has ruled on the claims that have been made, uh, you know, or, or is looking into the, the, the claims that have been made. I can tell you that uh, without a doubt, there are other matters that the member from Timmins should probably be asking about. We are trying to create jobs in Northern Ontario. I know that's something that the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines is working extremely hard on. I'm surprised the member from Timmins wouldn't ask a very important question for the members of his riding on that topic. Thank you. Supplementary. No, that's it. That's both questions. I apologize. I apologize. I erred. Next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today is a sad day for Ontario students and Ontario parents. Teachers unions across Ontario are encouraging a student walkout across the province instead of encouraging students to advance their education in subjects like math. Union bosses are clearly pushing their political agendas and trying to use our students as bargaining chips. Mr. Speaker, the minister is committed to working in good faith with teachers' unions as we work to improve Ontario's education system. Can the minister tell us what the government expects of those responsible for representing the voice of our teachers? The Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Thornhill for her question, because I know you care about getting the classrooms back on track. Thank you so much for that. But, Speaker, I have to share with you today the teachers' unions who are encouraging these walkouts are disrupting and distracting students across this province. While unions use the classroom to push their ideas and push their political agenda, our government is getting to work and focusing on the real challenge facing our education system because it's broken. Like, for instance, half of our grade six students, as the Premier mentioned before, are failing to meet provincial math standards. And that's where our focus is, preparing students for the future to improve their career pathways by focusing on STEM and math curriculum. That's why we needed to make a change and make math education compulsory in the Ontario Once. Teachers College. And that is why we're exploring making math skills minimum standards for teachers certification and recertification in the future. Teachers unions are abandoning the classroom to focus on cheap stunts. That's not absolutely Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. I'd like to thank the minister. And Mr. Speaker, I remain concerned about the safety and security of our students who are being encouraged to leave class. I've heard that some teachers might even abandon the classroom to join or assist the protests. Does the minister consider it acceptable for teachers to leave their positions in the classrooms to participate in these protests? Minister. Thank you very much. I appreciate this the question. This is a very situa serious situation. I do not considered the, that acceptable behavior from our teachers. No, I do not think it's acceptable. Our government believes schools should be nonpartisan, where students learn the knowledge they need to succeed. It should be nonpartisan inside and outside of the classroom. Unfortunately, the fact is teachers' unions are encouraging their members to put their textbooks down and, and carry on political agendas that are union-driven. 
And you know, Speaker, we want Position to bargain in good faith. We want to work with our teachers to ensure our students are receiving the best possible education. But unfortunately, union bosses are distracting teachers from this goal. This is unethical. It's wrong. It's manipulative. Spons. Students deserve better. Parents deserve better. And I want to remind parents that the Ontario College of Teachers exists to enforce instances of teacher misconduct. And they Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Stop the call. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last night, a recording of the Premier surfaced in which, when asked about job losses of providers of autism therapies, he claims, and I quote, there's never been one employee laid off in the frontline employee that has been laid off in the province. I'd love to fix it, but it's the, it's the Premier's grammar. But that doesn't jive. Order. That doesn't jive with the 19 staff laid off across Northern Ontario in child and community resources or the 17 autism workers laid laid off by the McGivney Center in Windsor, is the Premier still willing to claim that there have been no job losses because of his callous changes to the Ontario Autism Program? Premier. Thank you, through you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm glad that's proof in the pudding. I'm not in my office till midnight every night talking to families with children with autism. I think that was about 10.30. That was about 10.30 last night, actually listening to people. As we say, we are listening to the parents. We're listening to stakeholders right across the province. We're doubling, doubling the amount of money that the NDP cut with the Liberals at $235 million. We're putting over $600 million towards this program, making sure that we get everyone involved and listen to the parents, listen to the stakeholders, making sure we take care of the children. Thank you. Supplementary. Maybe he should listen to his own recording that claims that there was no layoffs in the province of Ontario since he's taken office. Because if those jobs that I already mentioned don't count, what about the 17 therapists that were laid off at ABA Connection in Ottawa, or the nine workers that were laid off at Kids Ability in Kitchener? And that's not even counting the 10,000 teaching jobs that are on the chopping block or the nurses that have been laid off across the province. So I will Government ask side, again. I will ask again. Premier, think about your answer. Does the Premier still stand behind his words that no frontline workers have been laid off under your Conservative government? Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, we're making sure no one's being laid off. We're doing extreme measures to make sure. I know the, the, the opposition Order. actually mentioned about teachers. I'll give you some facts about teachers, Mr. Speaker. Under the Liberals, there was 13,000 new teachers hired. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? The enrollment dropped 109,000 people. Wow. So we have 13,000 more teachers being hired when enrollment dropped 109,000. We're Order. actually protecting the frontline teachers, even though they're trying to attack us. We're still protecting them because the people that are directing you know, the big union bosses, like Sam Hammond, that's been there. I'm sorry, I apologize to the Premier. I have to cut you up. Stop the call. Okay. I could barely hear the Premier because of the cacophony <laughs> coming from the other side of the House. I was talking, I didn't hear it. I can hear you now, and I'd ask you to come to order. I would ask the House to come to order. Once again, I could not hear the Premier. I could barely hear the Premier's answer. The opposition must come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain will now come to order. The Premier still has a few seconds if he chooses to use them to wind up his response. Okay. Start the clock. The next question is the member for Mississauga East. Hey, hey. Now there's a member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday represented an important milestone for police and community safety in Ontario. Here, here. The Ontario Police College held the march pass and review ceremony. This ceremony represents the culmination of weeks of training for police recruits before they return to police services across Ontario and commence their careers as police officers. 
Mr. Speaker, Ontario's police officers are true everyday heroes, and these recruits are Ontario's next generation of heroes. Here, here. They are making they are making an honourable contribution to keep us safe, stand up for victims, and hold criminals accountable for their actions. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier please tell this House how our government is supporting and respecting the frontline men and women in uniform who courageously serve to keep us safe? That's Good a great question. Premier. For, for, for you, Mr. Speaker, what a great day. Great ceremony yesterday. I was joined with our incredible Minister of Safety Services and Correctional Services. Matter of fact, that's a tongue, tongue twister. By 12 o'clock, you can call call the, the Minister Solicitor General. Right. Because we're changing the Solicitor General. 12 o'clock today, we'll have a new Solicitor General with great, the same great ideas. But nothing was better than going there and watching 479 recruits. It was incredible. From 34 regions across this province, ready to serve. You saw the glow in their eyes, the enthusiasm in their, their faces. And, you know, they're going to focus on, on dedication, dedication to not only each other and their peers, but dedication to the communities they serve, because we're strong believers in community policing. Response. They're showing true leadership, true leadership amongst all 479, and I yeah. mentioned to them, show leadership again in your community and teamwork, yeah. focusing as a team, watching each other's back and watching the community they serve. It was just the best ceremony ever. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Premier for never, and I repeat, never wavering in his support for our men and here, women here. in here, uniform. Here. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is home to some of the finest police officers anywhere in the world. It is an honour to be part of a government that recognises their contribution to our communities and is willing to stand up for frontline police officers. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, our communities are most safe when the police, the people and their government are empowered to work together. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, could the Premier please share more about our government's commitment to supporting the police and public safety in Ontario? That's a great question. Premier? Through you, Mr. Speaker, that's one of our priorities, because you don't have a community unless you have a safe community. Right. And each one of these young officers the dedication they're committing for the rest of their lives, giving back to communities, not only just in policing, not just upholding the law, but getting involved in the community in and out of uniform. It is absolutely critical. The look that I saw, and I had an opportunity to speak to a lot of the 479, had an opportunity to speak to a lot of police chiefs. The appreciation they have towards this government is over the top. All I heard is thank you, keep going, we appreciate your support. No matter if it's guns or gangs, or the new OPP stations we opened up across the province, or proper communications we, we gave them to make sure they're safe day in and day out. But I want to thank them. I want to thank all the police officers across this great province for their support, for their service back to the community. They're absolutely outstanding people. Stop the clock. Order. Order. <coughs> Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Toronto Star reported details of yet another insider who has received a handout from the Ford government. Yeah. Former Conservative MP Ken Hughes has been hired to advise on this pressing provincial priority beer and wine in corner stores. He'll receive $1,000 a day for his efforts, up to $200,000 plus expenses. Not only that, but Ontarians could be on the hook for up to $100 million for breaking a negotiated contract. Can the Premier explain why the people of Ontario should foot the bill for yet another high-priced Conservative consultant and friend of the Premier? Premier. Uh, Minister of Finance. Questions referred to the Minister of Finance. Thank you uh, very much, and thank you for the question. Uh, our government, uh, Speaker, is committed to improving alcohol choice and convenience for Ontario consumers, something they have long asked for and something Premier Ford 
promised during the election that we won so overwhelmingly on the 7th of June. Mr. Hughes has been appointed to provide advice on how our government can fulfil that promise while expanding business opportunities. You know, throughout Ontario, you have to consider that we have the lowest density of retail outlets selling beer, wine, and cider and spirits. Quebec has 8,000 retail locations that you can buy a beverage alcohol. Ontario has 3,000. So we look forward, Speaker, to changing this trend, bringing more choice, more convenience to Ontario's beverage alcohol consumers. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. And as the Premier knows, this is hardly the first time one of his friends has been handed a high paying gig at public expense. Former PC Party resident Reuben Devlin has a $348,000 contract advising the Premier on dismantling our public health care system. Government side can order. The Premier's former tour director is taking home $350,000 a year in Washington, more than the actual ambassador. And Jenny Byrne was handed a lucrative job at the Ontario Energy you know Board her. with no background in energy. That's just a small sample. If the province is short of money for students and for seniors and for hospitals and schools and mental health, how can this premier find so much money to pay his conservative friends? Minister Kniff. Thank you uh, very much for the question. Again, the Speaker, our government is committed to improving uh, choice and convenience. So, because the Premier had never uh, met Mr. Uh, Hughes in the past, let me tell you a little bit about him. Let me tell you, uh, Premier, that uh, Mr. Hughes is going to lead discussions with key members of the industry, including the producers, public health, safety organizations, municipalities, restaurants, and bars. He brings extensive entrepreneurial and public sector experience that will give him this valuable insight. He uh, was a former uh, former Minister of Municipal Order. Affairs, uh, Minister of Energy in Alberta. He was an MP as well. He served as chair of the board of Alberta Health Services. Speaker, he. Stop the clock. I have to ask the member for Waterloo to come to order and the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade to come to order. Next question the member for Milton. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. It has been four days since the federal Trudeau carbon tax has been imposed on our province. We know that the carbon tax will increase the cost to heat your home, fuel your car and feed your family. Yesterday, I was pleased to have both the Minister of Health and Minister of Environment in my riding of Milton to speak about impacts of federal carbon tax on our hospitals. Can the minister please share with this House how the Trudeau carbon tax will impact the institution that provide essential and life-saving services to the people of Ontario? The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member from Milton for uh, welcoming the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care and I yesterday. Mr. Speaker, the federal carbon tax is going to hurt our health care system. Let me just give you a few numbers here, and I think the members opposite from the NDP should care about these because some of them are in uh, cities I know they care about. Hamilton Health Sciences Corporation will pay an additional $2.1 million a year by 22, wow. Mr. Wow. 2022, Mr. Speaker. Imagine. London Health Sciences Centre, an additional $1.9 million a year. Mr. Speaker. Ottawa Hospital, an additional million dollars a year, Mr. Speaker. The list goes on and on, Mr. Speaker. The federal carbon tax this year will cost Ontario hospitals almost $11 million, and that will go to $27 million by 2022. That's a $27 million health care cut by Justin Trudeau, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that $27 million is 104,000 MRI operating hours. It's up for 157,000 patients. That's 3,300 pacemakers. Maker implants, Mr. Speaker. Our plan proves that you can fight Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's clear that this carbon tax is going to place unnecessary pressure on our hospitals, and I'm proud to be part of a team that continues to fight against it for the people of our great province. Mr. Speaker, we were elected to put the interest of the people first.
to make life more affordable in Ontario and to end hallway health care. Meanwhile, the Trudeau carbon tax will make it harder for businesses to stay open and is a burden on institutions such as our hospitals. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please inform the members of this legislature how the federal carbon tax redirects focus from what really matters to Ontarians? Minister. The minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. in your riding yesterday, but there is no doubt that the federal carbon tax is going to have a direct negative impact on hospitals and make life more unaffordable for Ontarians. Hospitals in Ontario are already under enormous pressure. Diverting resources to cover rising heating costs instead of on reducing Opposition wait times door. and ending hallway health care is simply not acceptable. Hospitals should be able to focus their resources on providing the quality, patient-centered care that Ontario, Ontarians expect and deserve and not have to deal with unnecessary rising operational costs. Our government is committed to ensuring Response. our money is being directed to frontline services where it belongs to improve the patient experience and provide better and connected care. We will continue to fight the federal government's carbon tax on the people of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, Waterloo Catholic, Catholic District School Board issued surplus notices to teachers this week, signaling layoffs are on the horizon. The school board said that the $2.7 million cut from their budget is because of the minister's cancellation of the local priorities fund. This puts 73 jobs in jeopardy. Without this money, these educational workers likely won't have jobs come September. I'm wondering, Mr. Speaker, Minister, knowing that our kids' education and education jobs are on the line, why is the government eliminating the local priorities fund? Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, let's be perfectly clear. The surplus notices that are going out at this time from board to board across Ontario is routine. It, they're absolutely routine. And the fact of the matter is we're making sure that we're prioritizing how we invest in our classrooms, in our teachers, and most importantly, in the education that Ontario students deserve. Again, Speaker, we've inherited a system that absolutely crumbled under the previous Liberal administration. And unfortunately, people are taking advantage of that and manipulating the situation. But the fact of the matter is we're going to continue to focus on getting it right Opposition in the classroom order. because Ontario students deserve the proper fundamentals that ensure success for their careers down the road. And we're going to focus on getting it right and Response. making sure the investments are looking at making sure students learn math because it's unacceptable having over 50 percent of grade six students in Ontario failing math at this stage. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know what, Mr. Speaker? Even more jobs will be lost if the government moves forward with bigger class sizes. The Waterloo Catholic Board estimates that the class size changes that will cram more students into overcrowded classes means that there could be 80 fewer teachers in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. Talking about potential job cuts at Waterloo Catholic, Catholic schools is not fear-mongering, which it was, I was accused of yesterday, Mr. Speaker. These job cuts directly Come affect students, order. especially marginalized and underserved students. I am so proud of the students who are standing up for their education and walking out of the school today. That is true leadership, Mr. That's Speaker. Right. Minister, students at schools around the corner are walking out today. Will you go to listen to their concerns? Minister. Speaker, I'm always listening to parents to students and to teachers. And the fact of the matter is, when we're talking about class sizes, I have to remind the member opposite that she is doing nothing more than fear-mongering. Again, I'll pass over to the member opposite the CBC fact check from March 25th that showed even CBC. with increasing the mature class sizes by six students, we're still going to be some of the smallest class sizes across Canada. So really and truly, they, the whole party across the 
the House here need to get it right because the fact of the matter is we are investing in our students, we're investing in our teachers, and we're listening to parents because they're concerned that the Liberal government has absolutely destroyed the future of a generation because of their failed yeah. ideologies and their Response. failed experiments, if you will. But we're going to get it right, and the fact of the matter is people Students in particular should be in the classroom today, and if any teacher walks out, we expect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community, Social Services, responsible for women's issues. Recently, the North Bay Nugget released a staggering article titled Domestic Abuse Escalating in the Region. The article highlights that the OPP reported that the rates of domestic abuse in Northern Ontario increased by 150 per cent. Sadly, we know that victims of domestic abuse are often women. This is an alarming trend that we are seeing across Ontario, including in the region of Peel. Speaker, I can confidently say that our government finds these numbers appalling and unacceptable. Can the minister explain to this House the steps our government for the people is taking to make Ontario safer for women and girls across this province? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to thank the member for her question. Um, this government is going to continue to build our, on our historic investment of $174.5 million in funding for violence against women's services. That's why we're also tapping into a network of community partners, including about 900 member organizations, agencies, and partners to help stop violence against women and improve services for survivors. Sex trafficking, as we all know, is Ontario's dirty little secret, and I want to assure all members of this assembly and every person in the province of Ontario that our government takes that issue particularly seriously, and we're going to continue to build on the strong work of the Minister of Labour, Laurie Scott, and that is why we are doing a number of different things, like not only talking to those 900 member organizations, but we are uh, created a task table within our own multi-ministerial. We do have consultations ongoing with the member from Mississauga Centre and the member from Cambridge. In addition to that, I'm working Spons. with the federal government so that we can bring more attention to this issue and more funding. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her tireless efforts in combating violence against women and girls across this province and for standing up for vulnerable women each and every day. Speaker, Northern Ontario is home to many Indigenous communities. Sadly, Indigenous women continue to experience significantly greater rates of violence in Ontario. Indigenous women are three times more likely to experience violence than non-Indigenous women, and they are two and a half times more likely to experience spousal violence. Speaker, these statistics are not only heartbreaking, Order. but they are intolerable. Can the minister please explain what our government is doing to work with our Indigenous communities to combat this disturbing trend? Minister. I had an opportunity a while at the United Nations to work with some Indigenous partners uh, from across uh, Canada to talk about some of the work that we're doing here in the province of Ontario. By working together with our Indigenous partners, we are developing and delivering policies and programs that put an end to violence against Indigenous women. The ministry supports Indigenous-led public education, prevention campaigns, and community-based services, such as the Family Wellbeing Program, which supports Indigenous families and communities in addressing the effects of intergenerational violence and trauma and reducing interactions with child protective services. The, the Ghana Way to Win, taking care of each other's spirit, which raises awareness about the signs of domestic violence so that people close to an at-risk woman or abusive partner know what to do to help. But I appeal not just to uh, women in this assembly and across the province to support Indigenous women Response. who are being uh, at risk of violence. I encourage all strong men across this province, including in this chamber, to take a strong stand against violence against women, in particular Indigenous women who are at a greater risk of violence within their own homes. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. Doc Dr. Mackey, the Chief Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, is sounding the alarm about opioid deaths in the London area. There have been 16 overdoses in the past week alone. He says it's, quote, the worst it's ever been, end quote. 
Why is this government reducing supports to overdose prevention sites when this crisis is growing worse every day? Right on. Questions to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. I share your concern and Dr. Mackey's concern. We are in the midst of a public health crisis with respect to the opioid situation, and we are addressing that with the sites that have already been approved. We announced them last Friday. There are 15 sites that have been approved with three new ones, I might add, three new ones, one in St. Catharines, one in Thunder Bay, and one in Parkdale. So rather, we are increasing the number of sites in areas where there is particular need. We are still accepting applications and are reviewing them. There are more sites to be appointed. We do take it seriously, and we are acting on it. Supplementary. My question back to the Minister of Health. Today's London Free Press lays out the toll this crisis is taking throughout southwestern Ontario. Three dead in Brant County and one dead in Oxford. 16 overdoses in London. This is a crisis that is killing people every day. At a time when we should be looking at every possible way to save lives and confront this crisis, why is the Ford government cutting funding and closing prevention sites in Ontario? Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, through you, in actual fact, the funding continues. The sites will remain open. The 15 sites that have been approved, we announced last October that we were encouraging people to get into treatment. So the sites that have been approved, first of all, are in appropriate locations. They also provide the wraparound services that are necessary, and they also involve the communities and the decisions with respect to those locations. So we want to make sure that we prevent deaths. Of course we want to do that. But we also want to make sure that for those people that want to enter treatment, that those wraparound services are available, because when someone chooses to accept treatment, we need action needs to be taken immediately because these are people who often don't have homes, they sure don't have cell phones, and the opportunity presents itself only once. So we want to make sure Response. that these sites remain open, but we also, in the bigger picture, on our mental health and addiction strategy, that we have the detox beds that are necessary, that we have the community mental health and addiction services that are necessary. So the consumption and treatment services are one. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. That's a great yeah, he indeed, indeed he is. Speaker, our government was afforded a mandate by the people of Ontario to make life more affordable for them. As we continue to work tirelessly to keep this promise, affordability is being threatened by the federal Liberals and their carbon tax. Okay. A carbon tax that they would have you believe will leave Ontarians in a better financial position. But how does that work, Speaker? My constituents simply do not believe that any tax of any kind leaves anyone better off. This tax has already raised gas prices by 4.4 cents a litre, and we know that heating costs and grocery bills are next to rise. Can the minister tell this House what we're doing to ensure we're reducing emissions while keeping life, making life more affordable for Ontarians? The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, and I know he does a fantastic job of he representing. Sure does. He's a great He's a great member. I'm blocking his shot right now, which probably doesn't help. But, um, but Mr. Speaker, uh, let me tell you, the federal carbon tax is going to attack the affordability of everyday goods for everyday Ontario. $648, Mr. Speaker, the price in 22, 2022 for an average family. $648 additional charge for that federal carbon tax. So, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, we are leading the charge. Along with my caucus colleagues, we have been going riding by riding, speaking about the impacts of this carbon tax. And, Mr. Speaker, it's not just in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, Premier Ford has been leading the charge across this country. And I'm pleased to say that just yesterday, the province of Manitoba, another provincial premier who sees the the wisdom of challenging this federal carbon tax in court because it's unconstitutional, it's unfair, it's a bad tax, and we don't need it to be on the Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. I know that businesses in my riding of Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill are deeply concerned about how this federal carbon tax will impact our economy. We know we can expect farmers, truckers, hospitals, universities and colleges, families and seniors to all feel the impact of this job-killing, regressive carbon tax. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that works to find solutions that won't cost the hardworking people of Ontario. That's a great idea. Our government recognizes that we must play a part in fighting climate change, but we also know that there are more than one way to fight climate change. I know the minister has been speaking with many people about this carbon tax lately. Can he tell this House what he has heard and share some of these concerns with us? Chair, minister. Mr. Speaker, people across Ontario have been very interested in our Made in Ontario plan. They appreciate that we will hit the federal gar car carbon targets for a uh, 30% reduction by 2030, but without a carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, we were at Algonquin College when we talked about students paying $20 million more uh -oh. because of the carbon tax. We were in Woodstock with the Minister of Agriculture and the Premier talking to farmers about increased costs on the farm. Seven cent increase in diesel fuel, Mr. Speaker, unacceptable. We spoke to drivers in Etobicoke on Monday about that four and a half cent increase that'll go up to 11 cent increase oh, in gasoline. Ouch. Mr. Speaker, I was with the Minister of uh, Seniors it, speaking with a family, a family talking about the impact for people on fixed incomes of, of a carbon tax. Unfair, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Yesterday, we were talking in Milton about the impact on hospitals. $27 million, Mr. Speaker. That's a $27 million health care cut by Justin Trudeau. Response. Mr. Speaker, the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce says it's an income redistribution scheme that's going to make us Competitive, Mr. Speaker, we'll keep talking to Ontarios, keep talking about our plan, and keep fighting this carbon tax. Here, here. Thank you. The next question is the member for Peaches East North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The government has released its 2018 Poverty Reduction Strategy Report, and it was astonishing to find that the entire report is only nine pages long wow. and contains no specific plans or frameworks to address poverty. Poverty is a systemic issue that impacts Black and Indigenous communities that deal with systemic anti-Black and anti-Indigenous race, anti racism, as well as people with disabilities and mental health and addictions challenges. Can the minister explain why she cut promised and desperately needed OW and ODSP increases and cancelled the basic income pilot when she has no plan to deal with the systems that push people into and keep them in poverty? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I'd like to thank uh, the member opposite for bringing poverty reduction to the floor of the Assembly today. As many Ontarians know, one in seven of our neighbours is living in poverty today, and we have to do more in order to support that. That's why we increased social assistance rates across the board, 1.5 per cent on ODSP, 1.5 per cent on Ontario come to order. That's why we had a 100-day plan to turn social assistance around in this province so the 1 million people who are relying on social assistance, either on ODSP or Ontario Works, will have a hand up so that those who can work will get a job, and those who can't work will have greater wraparound supports. That's why I'm working with the Ministry of tra tra Training, Colleges and University to ensure that we have better employment supports for people. That's why I'm working with the Minister of Health so that we can provide better mental health supports. That's why we're working with the Minister of Education to support more affordable childcare. We believe that there's a better way forward than just simply doing what the previous Liberal administration did, which put one in seven people into poverty in this province. We can end Thank Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Poverty has deepened under this government. In the report, the minister again touts her line that the best social program is a job, yet this government is doing everything in its power to undermine the quality of work available to people looking to get out of poverty, like changing the law so people earn less from working overtime or freezing minimum wage that would have put more money back into the homes of Ontarians who need it most. Why did this government go against all the evidence and cancel a minimum wage increases, increase that would have pulled many Ontarians out of poverty? Minister? I mean, this is disappointing rhetoric from the New Democrats who do not believe that people should be working in the province of Ontario. Here, here. The Minister of Economic Development and Trade has told this House consistently Opposition that there are 200,000 vacant jobs out there. Wouldn't it be great if the social assistance program actually transitioned people who could work into good uh, paying jobs across this province? Wouldn't it be great if we understood that the best social program is a job? Wouldn't it be good? 
Stop the clock. Order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. I stopped the clock. I apologize to the minister. I could not hear what she was saying once the standing oration erupted on the government side. I can normally hear you, but I couldn't at that point. That's why I interrupted you. Next question. We restart the clock. The member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Speaker, students in my riding consistently have said to me that the cost of post-secondary education skyrocketed under the previous Liberal government. Since 2006, undergraduate tuition for Ontarians has risen from an average of $5,000 to $9,000. The students and families are frustrated that the previous Liberal government propped by the NDP allowed fees to increase, making universities and college more unaffordable for families and students. Can the minister please tell us what steps our government is taking to provide students and families relief? Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Scarborough Rouge Park for the question. Students and families make great sacrifices to pursue post-secondary education, and for them, every dollar counts. Ontario's Government for the People is lowering tuition fees and giving students the power to choose the services they support on campuses. Lowering tuition fees keeps money in the pockets of students. We will restore financial sustainability to OSAP to ensure the program is sustainable and supports the students who need it most for years to come. We are bringing predictability and transparency to the fees students pay by creating a province-wide student choice initiative. Reducing tuition and increasing the affordability of college and university will help Ontario students get the education and training needed for the good-paying jobs in our Response. modern economy. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. Speaker, our government was elected on a promise to put more money back into the pockets of the people. I am proud that our government is taking action to reduce the cost of post-secondary education by reducing tuition and ancillary fees. For years, students have been faced with skyrocketing ancillary fees that paid for services they often didn't need or use. These ancillary fees can be as high as $2,000, and the previous Liberal government did nothing to stop them increasing year over year. Can the minister tell us what more our government is doing to provide real relief from college and university fees for students and their families. Yes, interest rates. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. The Student Choice Initiative is about providing students and families the opportunity to save money. Students are making substantial financial decisions by choosing to attend university or college. Our government is treating students like adults by giving them the opportunity to save money and increasing transparency so they know where their money is going. In fact, a student in the member's riding studying nursing at the University of Toronto will save $940 wow. next year thanks to our government's changes. Speaker, the Student Choice Initiative, coupled with a first of its kind, 10% reduction in tuition represents real savings for families and is another step in our government Response. fulfilling its promise to put money back into people's pockets. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again. Next question, the member for Hamilton East Stony Creek. The House will come to order so I can hear the member who's got an opportunity to ask a question. Start the clock. Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Uh, my question to the Premier. I received a complaint, uh, Premier, recently from a constituent, Ms. Pooja Singh, who lives in Winona, north of the QEW. 
She recently purchased her home based on the province's promise that frequent, all-day two-way go rail service was just around the corner. Then two weeks ago, Mrs. Singh learned that she would have to keep waiting. She writes, we are left regretting the purchase of our home because we can't imagine the long commutes in rush hour traffic in store for us to Toronto. The previous Liberal government kept delaying frequent all-day two-way go to Hamilton. Why is the Premier and the current minister delaying it even more? Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Minister of Transportation, I'm pleased to, uh, to, pleased to respond to the member. I think uh, the, the Minister has been very clear in this House on behalf of our government, on behalf of Premier Ford. Uh, we're very committed uh, to, uh, to transit, uh, to increasing uh, opportunities in this province. Uh, I think the Minister, uh, who has toured, quite frankly, you know, I, I think from a, from, a, from a ministry perspective, Minister Urich and his parliamentary assistant, uh, Ms. Surma, have been very open and accessible to the people of Ontario. So with all due respect to the member, you know, I, I, I believe that Minister Urich has been responsive and receptive. Uh, if the member would like to uh, pass me uh, along that, uh, that uh, constituent's uh, concerns, I'd be more than happy to present it. But you know, I think it's pretty disingenuous from, from the opposition who support it. Can I ask the minister to withdraw the unparliamentary comment? Withdraw. To withdraw. Withdraw. Supplementary. Anyways, uh, Sp Speaker Hamilton is growing fast, Minister, with realtors touting the province's promise of frequent, all-day two-way go rail in their sale brochures. If there are plans to build more homes then there must be a plan to get these new residents to and from their places of work. But if there is a plan, the minister is keeping it secret from the people of Hamilton. Will the premier and the minister commit to funding frequent all-day two-way go traffic or go rail to Hamilton and give Hamiltonians like Mrs. Singh a precise date when, they will hap when this will happen sooner than 2031? Wow. Minister of Affairs and Housing. Well, 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 again, Speaker, you know, there, there's a party opposite who, for 15 years, supported Prop the, up. the previous government. Position come to order. Been done in terms of transit. They can howl all they want, Speaker. But Position come to order. Facts, you know, our government has committed. Our premier and our minister are going to build transit in this province. I think they've been clear. And, and in fact, and in fact, the member opposite. You know, should talk about the fact that the minister was in Hamilton last week to talk about the LRT. You know, the fact that the minister has made a commitment to the people of Hamilton, and, and you know, quite frankly, the minister has been so accessible. I'm telling you, between him and the premier, they've been so accessible to order. Ontario's 444 municipalities to, to talk about their transit needs. Our minister of infrastructure has been so accessible when it comes to the infrastructure needs Spons. of 444 municipalities. There's a party that supported the previous government and got nothing done and racked up a, a, a huge deficit that's saddling the order. Order. Member for Hamilton East Stony Creek has to come to order. The member for Brantford Brant has to come to order. Next question, the member for King Vaughan. Thank you, Speaker. This question is to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, on Monday, gas prices went up five cents a litre as a result of the Liberal Carbon Tax. But we know that this price is only going to increase over time. This isn't surprising, though, Speaker, because the Prime Minister has said that record high gas prices are, and I quote, exactly what we want. But this isn't what Canadians want. And this Premier and this government will not sit idle as the Trudeau carbon tax cripples Canadians' household budget. The Liberal carbon tax is not an environmental plan, because if it was, Speaker, the Prime Minister would not have negotiated massive exemptions for Canada's largest emitters. They would be able to pollute for free while families and Question. seniors and small business owners get hit with the full force of the tax. So to the Minister, will you commit today to stand with taxpayers and stand up against this tax crash? Questions to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Commit now. 
Mr. Speaker, I know I speak for all the members of our government when I can say yes, we will stand with that. He's committed. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the story that the federal government has been talking about, that you need a carbon tax to fight climate change, is disingenuous, Mr. Speaker. Our Maiden Ontario plan— That's an unparliamentary comment. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw and conclude his response. Withdrawn. Uh, it's not, it's, it's un, the carbon tax is unnecessary to fight, uh, to fight climate change. Mr. Speaker, we know that our Maiden Ontario plan will meet the targets that the federal government set. What we don't understand is why the federal government isn't interested in talking about that. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, they're interested in raising taxes. They're interested in making life more difficult. Uh, they're making, interested in making life harder for families, harder for job creators. Mr. Speaker, NDP? now there are six provinces, Mr. Speaker, six Spons. provinces, including NDP Alberta and PI, Liberal PI, who are fighting the climate plan. Mr. Speaker, they've lost, they've lost the confidence of the pe people, Mr. Speaker, in terms of their climate plan. They should listen to the provinces. Listen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That concludes question period. Member for Peterborough Kawartha has informed me that he has a point of order. I recognize the point of order. I'd like to let the House know that on Saturday, April 6, it's National Tartan Day, a day to celebrate the 4.6 million Canadians of Scottish descent. I'd encourage everyone to come out on Saturday, let your inner Scot out, and lang may your lum reek. <laughs> I, I believe the, uh, the member for uh, Sault Ste. Marie has a point of order, I gather. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do have a point of order. Uh, following your ruling uh, at the start of question period uh, this morning, the member from Toronto, St. Paul's, referred to us uh, on this side of the room as effing a bleeps. Um, if the audio doesn't capture it, I'm sure the video will. I know it will. It was very, very, very clear. I believe we all deserve an apology. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't hear it. <coughs> the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services on a point of order. Follow up uh, from the member from Peterborough. Obviously, April 6 is very important for those of us who are Scottish. Uh, I'd just like to point out that the most beautiful tartan is the one that the Minister of Finance is wearing today, the Loud McLeod tartan. <laughs> <laughs> member for Oakville on a point of order. Thank you very much. I just want to state for the record. Uh, my daughter, who has served as a parliamentary page in the last parliament, in a nonpartisan way, I might add, did not sign uh, the petition. The petition by the member from St. Paul uh, on the record. not a valid point of order. I've already ruled on that matter. I think the member for Ottawa, Ottawa South has a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'd, I'd just like to welcome Chloe Weston and uh, Sasha McCormick from Grade 8 from uh, uh, Mount Lee Elementary School, and they're here to witness uh, the decorum in question period. Thank you. I believe the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills, has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome uh, uh, the pharmacist, Mina Bashta, one of our brilliant Ontario pharmacists. Welcome in Queen's Park. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>